Hi, everyone. This is Dallin Wortham from the Charter School Connection podcast. Man, the podcast that you're about to listen to is a very special episode. It's where I meet with Mary Ellen Lee from Leading Edge Academy out in Arizona. The insights that she gives as a teacher, leader, principal, administrator are second to none. They are fantastic insights that I really think that as a charter school leader, you will enjoy. I had a blast listening to her stories, her insights, um, the people that inspired her, her goals, what she's learned, and uh, the fact that she took her time, which is sacred as a charter school administrator, and was on our podcast to share her insights with us are, are priceless. If you get a small fraction of the value that I got out of this podcast, then it will be well worth the listen. Um, so please sit back, relax, unless you're driving, make sure to pay attention if you're driving, but enjoy this podcast episode with Mary Ellen Lee from Leading Edge Academy. All right, Mary Ellen, thank you for joining us on uh, the Charter School Connection podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. No, we're we're super glad um, that you accepted our invite. You're actually the first guest, and we understand how precious time is in when running a charter school. So the fact that you gave us a little sliver of of that time means the world to us. So, and I'm actually really excited to ask you a couple of these questions because Leading Edge Academy is um, where you you know you currently are is. It, it's a huge school in the area and you have multiple campuses and there's a lot of people that will be listening to this podcast that kind of aspire to get to where you guys are. And so I'm, I'm really excited to have you on. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first thing that um, we want to ask you just for, to learn a little bit more about you. So how did you get involved in education in the sc- charter school world? Yeah, so um, I was born into the charter school world. My mother was a charter school principal um, uh, back when, you know, one of the first charter of one of the first charter schools. And so I grew up in charter schools almost my whole life. I did a year or two of private school and then converted right over and um, graduated from a charter school. And that was my, honestly, I loved education. I loved my charter school experience. Um, I was able to be a part of a high school where I was able to graduate with three associates degrees before I even graduated high school. Um, I mean, it just really provided me a lot of really great opportunities. And so then when I went to college, um, my mother said, you know, you can be anything but a teacher. So I, of course, decided to be a teacher um, like a good like a good <laughs> child does. And so I started teaching math and I knew I really actually had a heart for um, older students and older students who struggled because math seemed to be something that was always just so um, hard to attain for a lot of students. And so I wanted to kind of conquer that. And so I started off actually in an alternative high school. Um, I loved it. I was there for a few years and then just a leadership opportunity opened up for me um, at a school that I kind of knew people at. And so I made the transition to be a little bit closer to home, still teaching high school math um, at Leading Edge Academy. And fast forward, 10 years and I'm still with Leading Edge Academy. I stayed as a high school math teacher for a little while, then became a head of their dual enrollment program and then became an assistant principal and then a principal. And now I'm at our, um, I call it district office because a lot of people don't know what a network office is when talking about education, but technically our network office. Um, and I kind of joke, I kind of do all the things that our executive director doesn't want to do. That's kind of my role. So uh, I wear lots of different hats like you will at a charter school, but um, but truly like I'm kind of the product of a charter school, which I think is a really neat perspective to have being in leadership. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I always kind of joke, it's like running through my veins. So yeah, that's no, how that's I got awesome. <laughs> and what was that transition like? Because I, I can't imagine that it's, easy to kind of let your love of education go and kind of jump more into like a leadership role or an administrative role, administrative role. So what, what was that like for you and what, how has that transition been? 
Yeah, you know, what's interesting to me is I even like, so there's a transition from being a teacher into just being a principal on campus, right? And it's, and then there's that transition from being a principal to then taking a step out and really kind of, yeah, being at the district or network office. And with each transition, there's a little bit of loss, right? Like particularly the student connection gets a little bit further and further away. And that's why a lot of us, at least for me, got started in education, right? It's like, I wanted that, that direct physical connection with students to be able to kind of help them achieve this goal. And really, so kind of what's happened now in this seat, what I've realized is just kind of my circle of influence is just different. So I'm still able to help those students, just not directly, right? Like, so now the decisions that I make apply to all of our schools and not just my classroom. And so that's been kind of really exciting for me to be able to develop policies to, um, help encourage our teachers at large, our principals at large, what we do as, as that makes us leading edge Academy. And so, um, so it was hard. It was difficult because I oh, I miss being in the classroom. But what I don't. But but what's exciting is just the idea that that influence then affects. It's a trickle down effect, right? So like what we make yeah. at this level goes to all the campuses. It goes to the principals. It goes to the teachers. It goes to the students, right? So like you get to have a, a larger influence, and that has been really exciting for me to see kind of like, whoa, that's a policy that we created and it's been successful or sometimes it's not <laughs> successful and we need to change. But um, but that is kind of what gets me up out of bed, you know, every day is just kind of the excitement of having of having that influence and, and seeing the results of it, right? Like that is really important. I'm data driven. Um, and so mm -hmm. making curriculum decisions, making making all of those things that as a teacher, I may have been frustrated with, like, why don't we have this or that? And then being able to say, now at this level, I'm going to give you that because I remember what it was like being a teacher when I didn't have yeah. that or, you know, have that support or that protocol or whatever. And so that um, you just kind of have to change your focus and realize you still are so very much influencing students. It's just in a very different, different way. Yeah, I love that. And if you don't, it's okay, but do you have any examples of, of things that you learned as a teacher that you have implemented now more as a, an administrator and as a leader at Leading Edge Academy that has kind of, you know, led to a positive experience? Yes, so like a million, but I'll, I'll narrow it down, yeah. So um, one of the big things I think is really important that we can lose sight of is is nobody gets into education for the money, right? You're not like, woohoo, I'm gonna have this like lucrative career in education. What So what you get as a teacher is you get a lot of very passionate people who are backed behind a cause and not a job, right? And so they will give and devote too much time, too much energy because <laughs> you're not dealing with a product, you're dealing with another human and their future. Mm -hmm. And that's so important. And so when I got into being a principal and then even more so, you know, at this level, I wanted to make sure that there was a space for teachers where they could be teachers and and have that space to dream and create, but then be able to go home and be moms and dads and, you know, devoted to their families. Oh, yeah, and that's not huge. Have to, yeah, it is. It's so huge. And so one thing that we were able to implement at our level in particular is we um, do half days uh, once a week, every single, every single week for our teachers. So they have that at least half a day a week that is just devoted to them to get caught up, to do their PLC meetings. We don't ask them to stay before or after to do any of that. Um, and then we don't over schedule them, right? So we don't say here's half a day. And then as a principal, I'm not gonna schedule what you do during that minute, you know, every mm -hmm. single day for half a day. We allow them to like own what they need to do in the classroom and give them that space. So that way they can have healthy lives. H having a healthy work balance was extremely important to me and I didn't have it as a teacher um, and, and by my own doing. And so we, <laughs> I, it's really important that like, we've been kind of able to create that culture of like, no, your family is the most important. And then we as an organization are going to provide space. So for our elementary teachers, they have that half a day. All of our teachers have the half a day, but then we go a step further with our high school teachers and they all have a PLC built into their schedule um, on top of that half day. So a lot of times it's really hard at the secondary level to meet with your team because you know, you have 125 kids and you're teaching all the different subjects. And so we align it to where our math and science teachers and then our English and social studies teachers have space. Uh, they have about 45 minutes every single day to meet as a team. And to, again, to do that data dive, to, to do all those things that you'd be forced to do at home. 
Um, that is one of the things that we do and have a culture that I think is really unique to Leading Edge, but then creates really happy teachers and margin in people's lives. And, um, and so that's just kind of one of the things that's been really important to me. So it's having that. That's so cool. Yeah. Having that, like not forgetting what it's like to be a teacher, I think is one of the best things you can do as a leader, as a principal, as a, you know, at the district office, like just remembering kind of where you started and, and what were your frustrations and then solving those, right? Like that was same thing, like outdated curriculum. I refuse to have our teachers not supplied with the latest and greatest in curriculum. And so we adopted a curriculum, you know, adoption cycle. So every six years, student uh, teachers are evaluating their curriculum. We're purchasing new if we need to, or, you know, redoing what we had. And so really, really sticking to those and making those promises to teachers and following through has been kind of one of my biggest goals, right? Like in the position that I'm in now. That's so cool because I feel like a lot of times in the industry of, well, I don't like the word industry because it makes it sound like a product, but just like in the world of education, it's easy to say, okay, we need better leaders. We need to focus on our students. We love our students and we need to help our parents be more active at school. But teachers kind of get left out a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's so cool that you focus on teachers. My wife is actually a teacher and so is my sister-in-law. Um, Sean Wortham from Charter Connect, his wife is a, a teacher. They were teachers, but um, they kind of suffered some burnout, which is common in that field. Um, they were teachers in the public school space, which don't, doesn't allow for a whole lot of room. So I think that's amazing that you're able to implement that and see some positive results. Did you notice your retention rate of teachers go up after doing that? Yeah, so we did. And we've also done so as a woman, right? And in education, um, I have had three babies while being in education. And so um, <laughs> we've, we've provided, um, we provide paid maternity or paternity leave. So we do that. That's really unique. Um, just like, so those little things, like 100%, we, we have teachers who, I mean, like me, like I've been with my company for 10 years, you know, and that's not, I'm not the I'm not the longest tenured person at this organization. And so we've, I think that we've definitely seen people stay because they truly feel cared about when, when red for ed happened, um, our, our, t our school didn't shut down because our teachers were like, we have, we, we get what we want in the classroom. You know, we, they get a stipend every year that they get to spend however they want in the classroom. If they want to buy, you know, frilly board things, we give them the money to do that. If they want to, you know, whatever, have a special chair, then they can, they can get that. And so all those little things have really helped with our teacher retention. Not that we don't, not that we don't suffer like everyone else does, but I think that we have quite a few tenured employees, um, you know, compared to what I see in other, in other schools and districts. So. Yeah, that's really cool because you, you gave us two examples about how to help um, teacher retention and happiness for teachers. Yeah. One was paid, you know, giving them a stipend for different things. And one had nothing to do with money. So mm -hmm. it, you don't just have to give someone more money to be happy. Um, right. So I think that's fantastic. Very, very cool. And you mentioned a lot of things up to this point, which make uh, leading edge a, a very unique place to work and study, but what's the history of Leading Edge Academy? When did you guys start? How did you guys start? And maybe you can dive a little bit more into what makes you guys unique. Yeah, totally. So, okay, I'm not a dates person, even though I'm a math teacher, so I'm going to skip out on dates, <laughs> but I will tell you overall, because uh, I'll get in trouble if I get it wrong, but we started really small. So we, um, our founder is Delmer Giese. Um, he was a, or is a local pastor here in, in Gilbert, Arizona, which is where kind of our starting, our flagship campus started. Um, he had, we started with about 15, 16 students the first year. Wow. Um, yeah. In his church that they rented to us. Right. And um, from there, it just kind of grew and we've pretty much just been word of mouth, right? So now we have eight locations across the valley um, from Flagstaff, we just opened up this year, all the way to Maricopa, to Queen Creek, Gilbert, East Mesa, um, and then online, which we have students all over the state of Arizona and online. And, and I think that we've been able to be so successful because um, we offer a unique program. I'm a big believer that charter schools should be high caliber 
and that they should offer a unique program, right? Like otherwise, why not just put my kid at the district school? And so I think what separates us um, from a lot of other district schools and charter schools is our emphasis on character. Um, it's, it's easy to say for a school to say, um, you know, yeah, we care about character, but like everything that we do has the lens of being character above all else. So like our core values, the very first one before, before um, fiscal responsibility, before educating students, it is character above all else. And so every decision that we make is truly driven by having character and our curriculum is we're going to focus on teaching the students how to be good citizens. And, and the reason for that is because we're big believers that if we can produce children that have good character, right, they got into the world having good character, that that is <laughs> far more important than having book knowledge. Um, and that's what's going to get them a job. That's what's going to keep them in a leadership position at their job is having character. And, and the knowledge is important, right? Like, so we are still, we still strive in excellence in education, but, but really it's our emphasis on character. And I think our parents see that our curriculum characters woven through that our teachers like they have to talk about character and have good character and and it really trickles from it starts with Delmar Gisi as our founder of, of really um, allowing us to create that culture where our principals are first our teachers are first and our students are first it just trickles down when you can start with people who care about character and I think um, and not the dollar, right? Not the bottom line. Like that is what we care about. We care about our kids leaving and having good character. And so um, it sounds funny and probably very unconventional, but that has truly what has what has um, driven every single every single decision that we've ever made. And you know, like giving teachers more time, coming up with a paternity leave is like that is that is a good steward of you know it might cost us some, but it doesn't matter <laughs> because that's what having good character is. And so and. And when you, when your founder does that, and when your leadership team does that, it truly trickles down and just creates a culture. I love, we always joke, we're kind of like, we have a private school culture, but for everybody, right? In a, in a public school environment. And so, um, so it's really been like a good little niche for us. I think that's awesome. Because when I talk to some schools, I, I often hear them say, yeah, we're in like a really big city. So we have a lot of competition. And that might be the case. There might be a lot of charter schools in the area, but every charter school should be so unique that you actually don't have a lot of competition because there's only one you. And you shouldn't be the do all be all because if you're gonna try to be that, then might as well just be a public school. Um, so I think it's really cool that you mentioned, you know, having a really unique program, something that makes you unique and different so that the person that is looking for what you have to offer, you're kind of like the no brain option, so. Yeah. Fantastic. I love that. And um, for those that have never heard of Leading Edge Academy or that are in a different state than you, obviously outside of Arizona, what does your guys' grade level system look like and what programs and extracurricular activities do you guys offer? Yeah, so we um, we provide a very like I think robust experience for students. So we have a lot of our schools are K eight. So um, we have a few K eight schools, and and then we also have high school. So we we are K twelve. Some of our campuses were K twelve, um, some were K eight. But we strive to provide a little bit of everything for everyone. And so what I mean by that is that we are definitely like we. Um, we participate in programs like free and reduced lunch to make sure that our campuses are all inclusive of all income levels, that there's never any issues with attending our schools. That's really important to us. Um, we make sure that, um, like that we have, uh, like, do you mean like our grading system? Like what is our? Yeah, so more just kind of like what grade levels you guys have. So <laughs> K to 12 and oh, different. Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, so to answer that question, <laughs> yes. So we are K to 12. Um, we are online schools K-12. Two of our campuses are K-12. Charters are a little different. So technically we have one charter that's like K-8 and another one that's 9-12, but they are in the yeah. same building. So we consider them just a K-12 campus. <laughs> and then we have two, we have three campuses now that are K-8. So we kind of, um, we're starting to slow roll our high schools out. Um, we started with one high school for a really long time and then added our online high school. And then we launched uh, our high school in East Mesa two years ago now. Um, I would say that's like my one, not that you asked, but like my one tip to anybody who's starting a charter school is to start small and scale. 
right? Like we've been really successful with that. I think a lot of people want to open up and, you know, bite off the whole apple and just try to go out there in the charter world. And there is so much compliance in Arizona. There's so much accountability for charter schools in Arizona that until you get your feet wet, you kind of don't know what you're getting into. And yeah. so we've really stuck to, cause we are, we've, we've become a bigger charter, right? Like we're not the biggest, but we're definitely not a small guy anymore. And so it's funny no. as we open, we still open the same way we opened back in the day where we start really small and then grow by word of mouth. And that's really allowed us to be fiscally responsible, still produce high test scores, mm -hmm. still give our students all the offerings that they've been able to, to have. And um, that's been really important. You know, so I sit on the, on the charter board and it's, and it's interesting, like the biggest, when, when people come before us, right, for compliance issues or something like that, almost 100% of the time, it is due to just biting off more than you can chew. And so we try to desperately, you know, when I'm sitting on the board and they're talking <laughs> about expansion and doing all these things, I'm like, yes, we totally want you to get there, but please do it in a slow, like proven way. Cause it's just, yeah. it's so much better for students, for teachers, for leadership. When, when, when you really take the time to scale, I mean, even us doing it in a slow way, we kind of went from one campus to two to four to like, it was like, we had to take a minute when I got into this role and I'm like, we need to like reevaluate. We need to redo all of our processes <laughs> because we're no longer 15 students in a church. We're now 2000 and, and we're still doing some of the stuff the same way. And so um, that would kind of be like my biggest piece of advice is like just be okay with slow, slow proven growth. I think that's so important in the charter world. And again, we kind of see things as a product and we see this big goal of I want to be 10,000 or 20,000 or whatever. And instead it's that slow sustained growth that really creates great environments for teachers, for principals, and, and more importantly, most importantly for students. Um, anyway, I don't know how yeah, I got there, I but I just feel like that's really important to share. <laughs> I know. I love that. How, how do you know when it's the right time to grow, when it's the right time to build a new facility or to ex like expand to a different city, like um, Flagstaff, for example, I know that you guys are working on your Flagstaff campus. How did, how did you select that location? And when it's so far away from like your home base, like how, yeah. how explain that. I think that's oh, so Dallin, interesting. If I, could, if I could tell you the guaranteed <laughs> way, um, I, 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 uh, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know myself, but I'll tell you what we do. So we, um, here's what I found. So I have found that if you are growing, I think there's, there's kind of two answers to that question. So if you're looking to grow close, like in other words, hey, we're in Gilbert, when do we open up our second Gilbert campus or, you know, a campus that's maybe just a few miles down the road, we make those decisions based off of enrollment, right? Like enrollment and then building capacity, right? So if you are, have, if you have consistent wait lists, you've done the work to do that, and you know, you've got parents knocking down your door, then scale, right? Scale within your surrounding community. Um, what we found though, to drive some of those like longer distance, hey, we're not really known in Flagstaff, how are we gonna do that? Um, you're not gonna, this isn't like the fuzzy answer, but truly it's come down to finding the right deal at the right time. There's um, getting real estate right now and is, is tough, right? It's expensive, mm -hmm. interest rates are going up, um, I desperately don't want to ever deal with bonds ever again in my entire <laughs> life. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm pro private financing. Um, but, but I think it's really finding a space that works and then get creative, right? So like one of our buildings, so we have gotten really creative with how we obtain our buildings, right? And um, so one of the ways is we lease out from local churches. So we have a campus right now of 500 students and those, and they've, that's become such a successful relationship is that that church literally builds, build the building for us and we rent it out from them. And wow. it's, it's become, and again, it started really tiny. We just used a couple of their classrooms the need was there. We blew up and it became such a positive relationship. We don't have to own the building and we just get to, you know, pay the landlord every month. But then we have other opportunities like our Gilbert campus. We're really proud of our Gilbert campus was an abandoned grocery store. Um, and so we oh, were cool. able to kind of take part of the community. We took that grocery store, turned it into a, a K-12 two level with the most amazing gym you'll ever see um, inside this grocery store. <laughs> 
Um, and we actually bought the surrounding um, buildings as well. And so we took over, so our junior highs kind of in these like wings that used to be a subway <laughs> and, you know, those types of things. And then our, and then the rest of our kiddos are in this two-story building. And again, we took something that the city was like, we need to do something with this because there was vandalism and all that stuff in this mm-hmm. abandoned building and really has made it, a, you know, a trademark in Gilbert. Um, and so same thing, we had another deal in Flagstaff where a church said, Hey, we hear what you do and we've got the space. Do you want to be here? And we said, yes, we do. And so I think it's really important, especially for charter schools, right? Like I think building, getting a building is one of the hardest things to start your school with, Mm -hmm. um, unless you have somebody that's just going to give you a ton of money, which if so, then great. Um, but we don't have that. (laughs) So I think it's really stepping outside the box and getting creative because charter schools have the ability to do that. And I think that that's, again, something that makes us really unique and really special is that we can be flexible, right? We can lease from a church. We can take over an Mm -hmm. abandoned grocery store. We can do all (laughs) those things. Um, and, and that is just, I think really important and it's been really great to like, really important part of like our success as well yeah I love that so be creative don't push anything um, wait for the right opportunity Um, I feel like this is a common problem with a lot of charter schools Um, would you basically agree with the idea then that it's important to like not get in over your head with like debt and try to like expand too quickly and what are what are some bad like things that people should stay away from like red flags maybe when when expanding yeah i think i think you hit the nail on the head right like financially you want to be secure right and so Mm -hmm. take the time be at the size you need to be at save the money you need to be at um, arguably until the point where you can afford private financing. <laughs> bonds just, I mean, lots of people have bonds. We have a school with bond. They're just not very charter friendly. Um, and so anyway, so I tried it. That's, that's my spiel. I'll, I'll be done talking about that. But, um, but I see it's this fast, fast growth. And then the other thing I see that I think is unique to charter, charter schools is to make sure that your leadership team has educators in it. Um, we've seen an influx. I, I think that. I've seen an influx of charters wanting to be started by business owners or by just people who have not been in education. And while I think the ambition is amazing and their heart is pure and genuine, ultimately you need educators, right? Like you need people who've been teachers, who have been principals, who have that piece to really help drive those decisions. Um, And I think that that is a part that's not really talked about a lot um, and that can get off track. And so I think just having that is, is also, is also really important. That's great. And that leads me to the next question is, you know, having educators in your leadership and in your staff and whatnot. And as you're growing, you're hiring more people. How do you make sure to hire the right teachers and right faculty members and right administrators because you know your core is for leading edge building character and you have like this this niche that you love and that you're passionate about how do you maintain that w- with your staff as you grow totally so we are very clear about who we are from the get go so every single employee actually will interview with our executive director which is extremely rare right so like our top person has interviewed every single employee on our campus. And so the way that it works is we let, you know, kind of our principals do that first interview, right? Like, so they kind of talk about, here's what the specifics of this campus is. This is what campus life is like. Here's what your roles are. But then we do a second interview at at our level, right? At the district level. And and it's really not about, hey, you're going to be working from 7.30 to 3.30. It's, It's not about that. It's about this is who Leading Edge is. And do you like us? Because we are unapologetically leading edge. And, you know, we've had people who are like, yeah, we don't like that. And we're like, great, that's totally fine. You know, go, you know, you're going to get a job somewhere else, right? Because there's such a need. And then we've had people who are like, this is the school that I'm looking for. And this is what I've wanted my entire life. And um, I think a really good example of this is we opened up our Flagstaff campus this year. And we originally had a principal who was one of our current principals who we thought was going to go and be the principal of that campus. Well, things change as they always do. Um, She was no longer able to be the principal of that campus. And so we were stuck. We had a school that was going to open. We had no principal um, and we had some (laughs) interviews, but nobody that fit 
who we were, right? That really knew what leading edge was, that was character above all else, was super passionate about that. Uh, and so we were stuck. We go, do we just hire a, a body, like a live person who's willing to be a principal <laughs> for us? Or do we start school without one? And what does that mean for enrollment? What does that mean for teachers, for principals? And so we really have like this, I would say one of our first like dilemmas of do we stick to who we are, right? And who we say we are, or do we compromise that a little bit and just, hey, we got to open a school, you know? And it's interesting. So we were able to... Um, through that whole process, we, we convinced one of our one of our retired team members to, hey, could you be an interim principal for us in Flagstaff for a little bit? And he said, sure. And so he got the, he knew who we are, got the, got the ball rolling. And then we had this idea and, and um, we're big on getting people out of retirement. And so we happened to have a principal <laughs> who had retired um, two years prior. And, you know, we called him up and said, hey, we have this campus that I think would be a perfect fit for you. It's going to be small. You're going to know every student, you know, blah, blah, blah. Did, did our, did our, our, our pitch. Yeah. And sure enough, he came and let me tell you, Dallin, had we hired anybody but him when we had gotten to Flagstaff, it would not have been leading edge Academy Flagstaff. Like we are so <laughs> grateful. And, and he didn't, he didn't start. We had an interim principal. He didn't start, you know, until a month into the school year. Um, and I can tell you this, like, for us to be able to have accountability to parents and say, you know, this, you got him and this is why we waited, right? We knew that this is what this campus needed and this is who we are. And I can tell you, we didn't lose one, we didn't lose one family. We didn't, um, all the families, in fact, it was the office that were so appreciative now that they met him and understand why we picked who we picked. And so it was kind of a real testing time for us, but but it just showed that like, if we stick to hiring who we are and we're unapologetically who we are and we're very transparent with who we are up front, right? Like these are the expectations. You must have character at our school. You must, you know, like these are the non-negotiables for us. Like I always joke, like in part of the interview, I'm like, all right, this is the part where I scare you out of the job. Like, do you still <laughs> want to work for us after I tell you this? And you know what? The ones that say yes, they thrive, right? They thrive here and love the environment and stay. And so um, it's really just not being too afraid to say no. That's been a big lesson for us is not just to put a warm body in because it gets scary. It's a hard environment for hiring right now. Sometimes you just want to stick a warm body in because you don't have, because there's such a teacher shortage, right? Such a staffing shortage, a bus shortage, mm -hmm. like all of these things. And, and we found every time we've done that, we've regretted it. And so we've really stuck <laughs> to our guns of we're no longer going to do that. And we're going to make sure you know, play the waiting game. And it's, it's really been successful for us. That, yeah, your answer was more than I could have ever asked for. That is a <laughs> fantastic answer. I love that. So, so cool. And you said that you didn't notice any sort of, you know, negative effect from taking your time and making sure that you stayed leading Edge Academy throughout the entire process, which kind of leads me to wonder, what is, your relationship with parents and you said that you grew by word of mouth so obviously your relationship with parents is huge how do you build that because i feel like as, as i've spoken with other schools one of the big things that they have a problem with is parents just not really showing up for like pta meetings or the right. teacher conferences or they're not very active in their child's learning and getting helping them with transportation and with their homework and just being excited about school. So how how do you build that relationship with parents? So I'm gonna give you my one trick, okay? And I swear <laughs> by this, I have, um, you know, I, I wasn't a principal for very long, right? Like I, I just a couple of years as a principal and, and I have the benefits of being a principal of, of multiple campuses, which was really great because I didn't, I wasn't just in one culture. I was able to kind of see you know, have experience here. And then, and I was able to be an assistant principal under a few principals. And so it's funny, I was in my second year as a principal and uh, we were launching the high school at East Mesa. So I was the principal for, for our high school, but the K, K-8 principal was still on campus. And um, I hadn't interacted with him a ton prior to that. Um, and I just, and I hadn't really been to the campus a ton prior to that. So I didn't quite know what I was getting myself into, but I'm like, you know, let's, here we go. I'm the high school expert <laughs> so I can get there. And it's funny, I noticed that the principal every single day was in the drop off and the pickup line. He, um, he literally knew the car, the, who was inside the car, who <laughs> was sitting next to the person that was driving inside the car, 
by name and literally spoke and said hi to every single parent in that drop off and pickup line. And let me tell you what he did there was more than I ever did with parents, you know, even because I would do that, you know, I'd pick up the phone and to celebrate the kid, I would, you know, do all of those types of things. And I can tell you that the most impactful thing I've ever seen is when a principal will get boots on the ground and pick and stand in that drive up and pick up line and, and take the time to connect with parents. So he wasn't just standing on the side. He was high-fiving parents, asking them about their students. He got mm -hmm. more information about parent praises, parent complaints than any survey we ever sent at the district level. And so that really reshaped kind of what, <coughs> excuse me, what um, our philosophy was of truly getting boots on the ground with parents and meeting them where they're at. Because every, we're a charter school, we don't provide transportation, which is so then how do we capitalize on that? Meet them where they're at. They have to pick up their kit. And so we are there <laughs> and doing that. I'm telling you, when we need to get documents signed, we are in pickup line. When we need to get all of those things. And so that has really been, I mean, it sounds so simple, um, but it takes major dedication. It took me a while. I'm like, what are you doing? You're wasting so much time. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm too busy to do this as a principal. I need to be doing this in the morning and having this meeting and doing that. And let me tell you, like it was every minute that he spent doing that was more valuable than any minute I spent on paperwork or in a meeting or anything like that during that time. And then you've created buy-in. So now it's not just the school's asking me to do this. Oh, but it's, it's Mr. K. Mr. K is asking me. And I love Mr. K. He says hi to me every day. Yeah, I'm going to show up to the PTO. Yeah, I want to do this. And so it's really, mm -hmm. and he does it, and he has a small school, but we scaled that. We scaled that to our larger campuses where an AP and then the principals are out during mm -hmm. that time. And not just, again, directing traffic, but getting parents to roll down their windows and, and having that conversation. And it takes, it takes work. It takes memorizing, you know, those kiddos' names and, and faces, but there is no better interaction that you can have and motivator than being boots on the ground with parents during those two times of the day. I love that. That's so cool. Um, I've been in multiple campuses and typically the schools that invite me to their campus and I show up to them and they're like, hey, like we really need to more students. We're really struggling. Like life's really hard. We're thinking about closing down. If things don't turn around, they are in their office and they're like in this obscure dark corner and we walk through the campus they give me the tour they don't really say hi to anybody because they they they're busy but they're not productive they, right. they but they they look busy and then the schools that are just like expanding like crazy like yeah we're building over here and over here and like the principal is just so much more relaxed and like they're not running anywhere they're like just calm and they're saying hey how's it going susan how's it going billy and they're like they know all these kids by name and same with the, like the cafeteria workers like oh come over here you have to try this this is like fantastic this is uh, like my favorite thing in the cafeteria and they're like saying hi to the cafeteria workers and uh, multiple times people say hey sorry i'm running late i'm doing the the drop off and pick up line and and it's almost like they're kind of embarrassed that they're doing it uh, with me i'm like your school is booming and you're yeah. amazing like, please take your time and finish whatever, like, you're doing, because it's obviously working, and it's very easy to just see the difference. I'm not saying that they are successful because they're more relaxed, and they know every kid's name, or that someone's unsuccessful because they don't, but um, it's just kind of the characteristics of a school that is is doing well versus one that isn't is something that I've noticed, so I'm really glad that you brought that up. Yeah. So, Another question that I have for you is how do you inspire students in today's modern world? Because it's kind of deflating as a teacher when students are sneaking, you know, cell phones and they're looking at their cell phone and not paying attention to you or the attention span seems to be getting smaller and smaller and students are, you know, maybe a little bit less motivated for certain things or um, they're just mental illness and uh, uh, mental health awareness is growing. And so we're kind of learning more about that. But how do you motivate students to learn when there's so many distractions? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think 
um, I think we're maybe more aware of it. I don't know that it's worse than it was back then, but then again, uh, you know, you're talking to a pre-calc uh, <laughs> math teacher who taught seniors, right? Senioritis is a real thing, my friend, right? So I, I think I've always had to deal with this as a teacher. Um, and I think though we see it more so in teachers even, right? Like of, of getting oh, them motivated. Point. Like I, I think it's one in mm -hmm. the same. And I think I think we are in a society now where no longer will I do what you say because you've said it and your authority, right? I think that is out the window. I think that was like my parents' generation is you just listen. When someone older than you says something, you listen and you do it. And now <laughs> I think that we are in a culture of why, right? Like they want to be, students want to be a part of something, right? Like teachers want to be a part of something, right? Like a movement, a cause, mm -hmm. a whatever it is, fill in the blank. And I think we as teachers, right, if you're talking about students, or we at the district level, right, if you're talking about teachers, have to stop saying, do this because I said so, and instead of saying, and, and instead motivate them and, and, and have them remember the why, right, or create the why if, if they don't know. I used to talk about that even like with my students, you know, of course, you get the age-old question, when am I ever going to use the trigonomic formula, right, when I get older, and I would tell them, I said, hey, <laughs> math is not about memorizing these formulas. What we're doing today is we are training your brain to become a problem solver, and I said, and here's what I'm going to show you, and I used to do this math problem where um, it was the same exact set of data, right? So I gave them the exact same set of data. I put them into teams and one team had to use the data to, um, or both teams had to use the data to defend their case, but they were totally opposing cases, right? And, and you could do it with math, right? One talked about the rate of change, one talked about the raw data. And so by the end of it, the students were like, Mrs. Lee, we just use the same data to prove two different points. I'm like, that's right. I'm like, do you see how easily tricked you are if you don't understand what you're actually doing? Like, you know now, like you can go out into the world and, and like be an analyzer and understand because of the tools that you've learned in this classroom. And it was so cool for them for it to like click, for them to see like, oh, this is the why. Like, it's not because Miss Lee thinks I need to learn, you know, the quadratic formula, right? But it's because this math, this way of thinking, this way of analyzing is going to be the skills to make me more hireable, to, right, to do all of those things. Um, same thing, because I think, I think math is hard, right? I think it's much easier, <laughs> right? Like you get into English and, you know, they can pick a project they're passionate about and write a paper, right? Um, but I think even down, and, and then it's to teachers, it's getting them to remember the why, like, why are you here? Why did you want to be this, right? And again, it's not because you wanted to sit in parent meetings. It's not because you wanted to have to, <laughs> you know, deal with discipline. That is not what you wanted to do. You wanted to be a change maker. And that's what you are. Like you are a change maker that gets to influence influence someone's life for the rest of their life. I can't tell you, like, I mean, you ask lots of adults and they'll tell you, why are you doing X, Y, Z? And, and I would argue a good chunk of them will say, because I had a teacher who, ex who exemplified this character trait or who did this, or who told me that I could do X, Y, Z, right? Fill in the blank. And I think getting people to remind them, like, this is what we do. It's not a product. It's a human. It's a relationship. Like it's, it's truly your life changer. I think that that is what gets staff motivated. I think that's what gets students motivated. And we just, we have to, we have to get to that culture of taking the time to explain the why to our staff and to our students. I think if you don't do that, then, you know, then you're sinking ship for sure. Fantastic answer. I love that. That's, um, that's huge because well, my son, he, he's three and he reads this comic book. And one of the characters, like, it, like he does it to be annoying, but he always asks why. Um, and then says, because of this, well, why? Because of this, why? And I think of, you know, that, that little cartoon character in the comic book as, as kids and teachers, like we, we want to know why. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And the question that I have for you is, it's easy to talk about all these things and these principles and like, oh, the why behind something. It's a lot harder to um, apply it. And it's also a lot harder when you're in the trenches and you're frustrated and you've already had a rough day and whatnot. Um, so it kind of leads me to this other question. How do you, uh, how do you handle dark or rough times when something goes wrong or when something didn't work out for leading edge the way that you thought it would, or maybe even as a teacher, when 
something didn't go well or right in the classroom. How do you and how does Leading Edge kind of make it through those dark valleys of running a charter school? Yeah, um, I think a big part of it, right, is redefining how you see failure. I think that, you know, I am type A perfectionist. <laughs> like if something is wrong, I'm going to be the first to point it out and go home and be <laughs> devastated about it, right? And so I really had to, and and that's just not education, right? You're dealing with people. It's messy. It's relationship involved, right? There's compliance things you're going to mess up on. Hopefully not, but maybe you will. Like all, like things are constantly changing, right? Um, and I think a big part of it for us was really having, we have confidence in our team, right? Like we make sure we, we believe like SEAL team six, you know, C C SEAL teams aren't <laughs> 50 people, right? In leadership, they are like the, the, the top of the top few and they are extremely effective. So we believe that we believe keeping, you know, having a leadership team that is small, but effective, right? Like just workhorses, power horses, people that we can trust. We have really high trust on our team. And I think that's really important. Um, but ultimately then when someone fails, it's not a um, gotcha. It's not a, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? It's a hundred percent. We see it as an opportunity for improvement and just like, well, we tried it and we're going to go try something else. We, we are a high risk um, calculated risks, right? Right. Like we're not risking student safety. We're not risking, you know, mm -hmm. compliance things, but, but yeah. we will risk opening up a campus in Flagstaff without a principal and seeing what happens. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and, and doing that and it happened to be really successful. Um, and we've also had situations maybe that weren't as successful and that we've had to learn and grow. But that I think goes back to like our character piece of like, nobody's going to be perfect. We're going to learn from it. We're going to take the info that we can and it doesn't define who we are, right? Like that's, I think, just separating that piece of, of define, having your failures kind of define who, we, who you are. We don't believe in that, you know? We believe in our team. We believe everybody has a great heart and that they want what's best and that they are um, just rock stars in their field. And so <laughs> within that, that creates a lot of safety for failure to happen and be handled, I think, in a really like healthy, positive way. I think that's fantastic. Um, I, I kind of compare it to, well, I, I always ask myself when something goes wrong, okay, yeah, there's these bad things that are happening and whatnot, but what do we have? Like, what what tools are do we have to get out of this? And one thing that when something goes wrong that everyone will always have, at least for a small amount of time, there's a small window where you have people's attention. It might not be good. You might be kind of going through a really hard time or maybe you made a mistake and people are, are want, kind of scared how you're going to recover from this mistake, but you do have people's attention. If you make a mistake with a parent, at least you have their attention. So what are you gonna do with that attention? It's an opportunity to twist it into a positive way. So how are we gonna learn from this and how are we going to you know, yeah. take this attention that we've been given and say like, hey, yeah, we, we made a mistake, but look what we're doing now. It's, yeah. it's, that's what public relations is. So. Yeah. And I think like something you kind of talked about, it's like kind of like owning it too. like anytime, like, cause we're not perfect, right? The principals, principals mm -hmm. are people and sometimes they handle things not the best or same thing with a teacher, a teacher in a classroom, you know, has a bad day, does something that's out of character. Um, I think owning it, right. Like owning that piece is really important. You know, I've seen a lot of, um, Kind of putting on my my charter board hat charters that come before us and and there's always two types right there's the people who they have these issues they come before us and they go not me not my fault i don't know what we did whatever and then we have these other types and that scares us like i'm like what do you mean you don't know like you don't know what you did then how are you going to fix it and make sure that you don't yeah. do it again because then we have these other types that'll come before us and say yeah like we messed up like we should have done this we should have done that we've put this person in place we've identified the issue and we totally sucked it up like you know and we're <laughs> like yeah you did but you created a plan and and you've moved on and we feel so much more or i feel so much more confident you know what i mean in those schools that come before us because i'm like yeah you did you messed up just like we all do but you have a plan of action and it makes sense and you're moving forward and 
And so I think it's that piece too, right? Like owning it, it, it goes so far with parents, right? Like, and, the awesome. cult and teachers, right? To own it. Like as a, as a principal, I remember, Hey, I gave you guys wrong information. It was a hundred percent on me. It wasn't my, it wasn't my district office that made me do it. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it was me. I, I sucked it up guys, you know? And, yeah. and there's just so much grace for that. I think um, we always get afraid to admit that, but truly anytime I've ever admitted that or been in those situations, I've, I've never not been met with grace, you know, when you, when you own those failures and then you talk about how you're going to learn from them. So I think, I just think that that's an important piece, you know, to, to mention. That, that's, I love that. I, I agree 100%. I, my twin brother, who is a fighter jet pilot, his commander or something, some, someone who's more important than he is, I guess, or not more important, but higher rank. Um, once told the whole like squadron, like, hey, no matter what you guys do, um, and when I say guys, um, guys and girls, or whatever as a team you do, um, just know that there's nothing that you can do that will make me not respect you or trust you. The only thing that you can do to lose my trust is to lie. Because if I don't know if you're telling the truth, then I, I just, I don't, I don't know what you're saying. I can't confide so in what you're telling me. So, but yeah. you can't do anything. There's no mistake too big that you can do that will make you or make me not trust you. So yeah. I, I thought that was really, really cool. And he said, once he heard that, that his whole squadron like just felt relief and comfort and like, okay, this is a safe space where I can make mistakes there. Yeah. You know, so I love that. Dallin, well, very, very cool. There there's just a book I want to mention that we took our leadership team through. Um, I forget do. the author's name because I'm not, I'm not good with remembering those things, but the title of the book is called extreme ownership. Um, it was done Ooh, by, cool. do you know who, have you, have you heard of the book before? It's, it's I a Navy haven't. SEAL. So he, you know, he talks about this and he does it. It's a really awesome book that I encourage all leadership teams to go through. Um, and it was pretty culture changing, even just for our principals and in our district staff. Um, to, it, and it was all about this, right? Like taking extreme ownership of your organization or your piece of the organization um, and just all the benefits of doing that. And so anyway, so just as a, as a little tidbit for people, um, the book's extreme ownership, I'll have to get you, I'll get you the, the name of the offer offline, uh, author offline, but, um, but yeah, it's a really, I highly yeah. recommend Is it. Is it Jocko Willink? Yes. Yes. That's who it is. Cool. Yeah. I've actually listened to his podcast. Yeah. Um, or a podcast that he was on. And I, that was one of my favorite podcasts. So that once you said Navy SEAL, I thought, oh, I think I yeah. know who this is. So yeah. fantastic. And we'll include a link to this book uh, in the show notes so yeah. that anyone that's listening to this can go and uh, check out that book. Uh, thanks for that recommendation. Yeah. Well, very, very cool. And so if not, it's okay. But um, one of the questions that I have is do you, have any, I don't want to say regrets, but if you could go back in time, would you do anything differently with your career or with um, leading Edge Academy or as a group, something that you said, okay, like we learned that this isn't the right way and now we're going to do it a different way. Anything that you, yeah. if you could go back in time, you would change? Um, my husband would tell you that I would not get into education and get into the business world so I can make a lot more money. Um, but <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But um, no, you know, okay, this is a cliche answer, but I think it reigns so true. I, everything that we've done or not done or messed up or been successful in has brought us to where we are. And I'm just so proud of where we are. I don't know that there's a lot of organizations that can truly you know, if nobody's listening, right, say yeah. that. I am genuinely proud of, I'm so proud of our company. I'm proud of, you know, who we are, what we do for, for staff, you know, for employees, what we do for students. Um, I, I don't think I would change anything. Um, I think, you know, sure, there's things that, you know, hindsight, I would do differently um, because I'm learning, you know, we're all constantly learning, but nothing where, you um, I don't know. I, I, I truly think that a lot of just as much as success teaches you, I think failure teaches it to you even better. <laughs> um, and when we haven't made any big 
big, you know, big things that I wish we could take back, right? Like nothing that's like, oh no, mm -hmm. we really need to take that back. So I think, um, I think overall there really isn't. I um, love that answer. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Well, so sorry, kind of cliche, but it is really the truth. <laughs> no, it, but it's, it, I mean, I won't even say it's cliche because I just feel like it's so sincere. So that's great. Yeah. I love that you're proud of, you know, everything that has brought you to where you are today. So, yeah. um, I guess the next question is, is there anything that you'd like to see happen within your local state or federal government where you're like, oh man, if this were to happen, this would be a game changer. Oh, you're going to get me in trouble now, Dallin. Um, <laughs> okay. So yes, there is. Um, okay. So in a, in a dream world, I think everybody would say this. Um, we, we just desperately need more funding. Um, we, we need more money in education. We need more, you know, per pupil, like peer, you know, per student funding. I'd love to get to a point where um, we can afford to pay teachers 12 months out of the year and use the summer months to really have some rigorous teacher training programs, like posts, you know, not just in their program, but actually have time over the summer to pay teachers and say, hey, here's all the things we want you to do and soak up over the summer. Um, and I think, you know, there's not funding for that or not adequate funding for that. Um, but it's been interesting, you know, we, schools have been lucky the last couple of years in regards to some extra funding that we've received due to COVID, right? Like this, S, these ESSER money that has come in, um, and to have that and to see the impact that it's had on our students, right, has, has been incredible, right? And that's just not even tons of money. It was just a little bit of money, right? And so I think mm -hmm. that, um, really being able to have more money would be huge. I think um, increasing teacher salaries in such a way that it becomes a coveted job, right? Where the pay scale is there, where, you know, people want to be doctors and lawyers, not typically because they're super passionate about it, but because of <laughs> the potential for pay. And, and I think um, if we could increase salaries to really make it desirable from that point too, I think could really benefit benefit students. Um, I think that that's, I think that that's really important. I, I don't want to see less accountability. I'm going to get in trouble for that. I know some people would probably say less accountability. Um, I am a big believer that when you use public money, um, that you should have some accountability for that. Um, and I think that Arizona has a pretty good balance. Um, I don't want any more accountability for our schools. So I'm hoping <laughs> legislature kind of backs off a little bit and realizes how much accountability just particularly charter schools have. Um, mm -hmm. But I think a lot of it is a funding issue. And I think um, getting creative with that, like, again, not just throwing money at it, but then saying, okay, well, if we, if we can pay teachers more and it's more of a year round job, then what, what does that mean? Right? Like utilizing those times, you know, uh, for, for trainings and for things that can't happen throughout the year when you're going crazy. I, I think that, um, education could use a little, little tweaking kind of overall the whole system. So if I, if I had that, that's probably, that's probably what I would do. That's a great answer. I love that. Very, very cool. Thanks, Marianne. And um, what projects or goals are are you currently working on or as a, a whole entire school? Are you guys excited about? Do you have anything on the forefront that you'd like to share? Sure. Yeah, I think, uh, well, we're kind of, I'm hoping I'm in a season of coming off of projects, but that seems to never happen, Dallin. <laughs> uh, um, you know, we Not have obviously our... Uh, yeah, our expansion into Flagstaff right now is is, is a big part of our focus. Um, we are also, and you know what, this is a really cool thing, actually. I'm glad you asked this question. So we are in the process of doing what's called a systems accreditation. So our high schools are accredited. I think that's extremely important for charter schools to be accredited. Um, a lot of parents don't know to ask that question. And, and just because you're a charter school doesn't automatically mean you're accredited. So for those that don't know, right, that are listening, that means, mm -hmm. you know, can I take my child's high school diploma and will any college accept it? Well, if you're not accredited, no, they won't. And so, or they don't have to. And so that was really important for me. Again, it goes back to that character piece mm -hmm. of, you know, these are things that not your typical parent would ask. And so we want to make sure that our schools provide that. And so, um, but we're going through a systems accreditation. And so what that means is now not only will just, you know, will the high schools where it kind of really matters, but our entire 
um, I'm going to use district and I'm using quotes, right? And <laughs> my fingers for those who aren't watching, but, <laughs> but um, we'll be accredited. So every school then that's part of Leading Edge Academy that now pops up will fall under our accreditation. And I, and maybe it was just me, but I didn't realize that you could be accredited that way as a charter school, because we are actually three charter, three separate charters um, in one organization. And so I didn't realize that that was an opportunity for us. And so um, we've recently found that out. So that, so we're spending this year of getting our entire charter organization um, accredited. And so that way, even like our kindergartners, you know, are having an, <laughs> are in an accredited program. And I think um, I'm just really excited, you know, about that next step for, for us. So I'm really glad I asked that question too, because I think that's a really unique and cool answer. Thanks for, yeah. for sharing that. So who, I guess this is more for you. Um, who is an inspiration to you in your profession other than your family? I know that you mentioned your mom, but do you have anyone who, and you don't necessarily have to know them personally, but is there anyone that you look up to, anyone, any authors or maybe someone on your campus or someone in, you know, back in the day while you were just a, a kiddo who kind of inspires you and has kind of helped you be the educator and administrator that you are today? Oh, okay. That's a tough one. Um, yeah. It's not a tough <laughs> one luck. because it's not like, I just like, I feel like in different parts of my life, different, you know, different people kind of serve that purpose, right? Like, mm -hmm. like depending on if I was a teacher, I would say um, right now, probably my biggest kind of influencer. Uh, I mean, I'm a big fan just to, I'll rattle some stuff off. Like, you know, Patrick Lencioni, like all of his books, I think are really incredible. Stephen Covey. I like, I'm, I'm a huge fan, mm -hmm. those types of things. But as far as like, when I aspire to be like someone, uh, it truly is our founder. You know, we, um, Delmer Gisi um, is truly the most humble and, um, you know, person that you will ever meet. I mean, he, he started, you know, he has these, all these schools, he has a successful church. He ha he does all of these things mm -hmm. and you would, you'd never know that walking down the street, meeting that guy. <laughs> and, and he has truly um, influenced and made leading edge who leading edge is. And it's made me, you know, a big part of who I am, right. Of constantly thinking about what is, what is beyond right? Like not even just mm -hmm. like what's equal, but like, how are we going to go above what's equal and really honor and serve other people? And at the end of the day, like, that's what I want to be known for is how, how am I honoring and serving other people? I don't care what my title is, how much money I've made, but ultimately like, what has my influence been in other people's lives? And is, am I able to leave people's lives feeling more filled, more, um, you know, more helped, more whatever, fill in the blank. And um, honestly, like he is the one person that I've met that just lives that out constantly through adversity, through, through thriving times. Um, he is always looking for ways of how do we serve people? I mean, that's how leading edge started is he saw a community and said, how do I serve, you know, these families that need this? And, and that's really what we did. I think it's big of, of creating a culture of finding needs. And so that's really kind of what I lived my life by. And so ultimately, like, um, not from like the educational standpoint, right. Of like master teacher, right. But like of who I want to be as a person, like, and where I think our organization needs to stay, uh, and why I've stayed in our organization is truly because, um, of, of our founder. I think that he just really is a man of character and that's, you know, what I strive and hope that leading edge kind of always is. So. Awesome. Well, I, I love that. And we'll make sure to include any links to the people that you mentioned in the show notes. So um, we're getting close to wrapping up. We have a couple more questions and these are kind of a little bit more fun, hypothetical questions um, that hopefully- um, Oh man, okay. Yeah, <laughs> and um, so you can kind of take them with a little bit more lightheartedness, but if your school had a magic wand and could just use it once and just poof with the, with the movement of the magic wand, one thing could happen that might be kind of unattainable or seems impossible or expensive or maybe just a problem that you've had for a really long time. What would that one thing be? Uh, now you're gonna see where me transitioning from a trans teacher to principal to now in the, in the <laughs> network office, right? This is such a network office answer. I would 
poof, own all of our buildings debt free. That that would be that would be what I use my magic <laughs> wand on. Because uh, all the other stuff, it. like we can do, like I can I can do all the other, I can hire incredible people now. I can do all of those things. Uh, I would I would poof and own own all of our buildings debt free. That is my non. Uh, that is my very straightforward <laughs> answer. <laughs> and I think that answer is perfect. And if you had, and when I say you, it could be you personally or as a, as a school. If you could have a billboard just right next to your school and just cars driving by your school would just see this billboard every day, what would that billboard say? Um, I think it would, I mean, it's gonna, I it would be character above all else. Like, I think that's who we are. That's what we live by. That's what our billboard would say. That's what our materials say. You know, it's funny to have a school again, talk about that. Um, it just drives everything about who we are. And so Fantastic. that it was, it would be school of character. Um, you're missing out. <laughs> you're missing out by not putting <laughs> your kids here. But, uh, but that, that's what it would be, is that we are a school of character. That's what ultimately, I don't care that we're known for anything else besides that. I love that. Very cool. And before we wrap up, is, this, is there anything that you would like to share? Any stories, any tips for anyone that's, you know, running a charter school or anything else that you'd like that um, you'd like to share before we wrap up that I haven't asked? Yeah, I think the only thing I can think of is just to constantly surround yourself by people who challenge you and inspire you and to not be an island. I think that um, one thing that sometimes we can do, because ultimately being a charter school is a business, right? Like, is that we can tend to be an island and to not want to reach out to people who are doing something really well, um, maybe that you want to do well, you're kind of afraid that you're going to get the no. <laughs> um, but if I could, if I could fix anything actually truly in education, if I had a magic wand that could, I could really fix anything that I feel like is it within control, it would be that everybody realizes that there's enough students to go around and that we should be sharing best practices with each other and that we should be all coming to the table. I wish charters saw the charter board as a way to like, hey, I need help, not just a compliance thing, you know, to reach out, ask questions, to get connected with other charter leaders, with other district leaders. Um, I think there's a big missed opportunity for that. Um, and anytime we've done it, believe me, it's been very scary. Um, and <laughs> I've, it's funny, we've always been um, welcomed with open arms and it's been really great. And so I think just reminding people that like you are not an island and that we there is enough to go around you don't have to be afraid of the person next door and instead open up the door and become the best that you can be because you are different and you're unique and so you're probably not even you know fighting for the same kids you know and just mm -hmm. realizing that that's okay I think that that's the biggest, I think, missed opportunity in education is just kind of the decisiveness between divisiveness, I mean, between district and charter and and what does that mean? And even amongst, if there's anything amongst charters, like, well, you know, we need to be mo more competitive. And I think it's just, it's realizing that we all just need to get together because again, we are not a product. We are in the people business. And ultimately just by getting together and sharing best ideas and doing all of that ultimately benefits human beings. And so, and that's what we should be in the business of, so. Wow, I love that. And I completely agree with everything that you just said. Um, I can't thank you enough for the fantastic answers you've given. Um, this podcast is the first of hopefully very many and that's what makes you know this episode special. But more than that, it's it's you and your answers have been um, home runs. So I couldn't have asked for uh, a better guest and someone more qualified to be able to answer these questions. So thank you so much for your time, Mary Ellen Lee. It's a uh, been a real pleasure to spend this time with you, and I feel like a lot of people are also going to be grateful for the insights that you've shared. Wow, that's sweet. Well, thanks, Dallin. And I will say, shameless plug, we are absolutely, we use Dallin, uh, Dallin's company, Charter Connect, <laughs> and we're super happy with them when we were not paid for this advertisement. But I did want to throw it out there just as a little shameless plug for you. I know you didn't ask, but we are super happy with your marketing services. And uh, Dallin, I just even appreciate, it's just an honor to even be asked. So thank you so much. Oh, uh, thank you so much, everyone. And for our guest, Mary Ellen Lee. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day, Mary Ellen. Thanks.